Misjudgment. Three syllables. The action of estimating or assessing something incorrectly. Disappointment. Four syllables. Sadness or displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes or expectations. Longing. Two syllables. A yearning desire. In a sentence, Ubisoft's misjudgment of what TU20 should introduce to the game led to grave disappointment for the community who felt a wistful longing for anything other than what was released in the first phase of the PTS. Wait, wait, wait. Don't click off. This isn't a toxic outburst, I promise. Rather, this is a constructive breakdown of what one passionate day one player with thousands and thousands of hours in the game feels missed the mark in Ubisoft's vision for TU20. It also serves as an open letter to anyone at Ubisoft who wants to hear it. You may agree with me, you may disagree, but whatever you think, please keep it respectful in the comments. As you'll discover later on, I genuinely don't think this is the result of anyone within the dev team that we know the name of. Without any further ado, let's hold hands as we depart on our voyage into the update which could take us, as a community, one step forward and 300 steps back. But before we do that, let's cover at a high level what was in the update. The TU20 PTS showcased a whole host of changes to the game, some of which were published in the patch notes, some of which weren't. Let's do a very quick review of what these changes were so you're up to speed. If you'd rather read the notes in full detail yourself, I've put a link in the video description. Firstly, there were changes to the inventory management system, alongside tweaks to existing game modes, Descent, Countdown and Summit. Next, there were changes to core mechanics in the game. More on this later. Some were bug fixes, some were intended to improve quality of life going forward. Finally, there was a huge balancing pass. I say balancing lightly there, and again, we'll cover that in more detail later. Chapter 1. The Inevitable Creeping of Power We're all gamers here, so let's do a quick little role-playing game. Close your eyes, clasp your fingers, cross your legs, whatever you need to do to get in the zone. RPG starting in 3, 2, 1. You've made a new looter shooter game. You release a bunch of gear at launch which players are loving and playing with every day. You're planning your next big update and have plans for this to really shift the meta and give the players that have put hours into the game a reason to keep playing. Before release, you have the sudden realisation that you want the new gear to be meaningful, but the current gear is strong enough that in its current state, it will stay on top and your new gear won't offer any benefit to players who already have the best gear. Your gear just offers a new way to play, not an optimal way to play. You're now faced with three options. Option 1. Do nothing. Release the gear in its current form and see if players like it for the same creative reason you conceived it, even if it's not the best option for any given scenario. Essentially, you rely on players understanding and agreeing with your vision, without being able to actively communicate it. Option 2. Buff the gear you're introducing. After all, this makes your new gear powerful, and the old gear still performs as it did. Players will essentially be forced into grinding for your new gear if they want to stay optimal, but it will feel like their own choice. Option 3. Nerf the current gear to sit below your new gear. Yes, this gives you a very similar end result to option 2, but with one huge unwanted side effect. The community is now much more aware of the fact that they need to farm the new gear to keep playing the meta. Their old gear now feels useless and this kills any excitement that could have been generated, which ultimately leads to decreased long term revenue. Now, playing the game feels like a chore and it will take a while to recover the reputation you lost. Which do you pick? Option 1 leaves you with no revenue stream in a month, 3 months, a year. Scrap that. Option 2 gives you all the money. Should we run with this or option 3? Option 3 could give you all the money, but it could also leave you in the same position as option 1. Hell, option 2 is safe and lucrative, let's do that. Now, the same situation repeats itself days, weeks, months later. We're faced with the same problem, we pick the same option. This cycle repeats over and over. Our focus is on the now. Make money, please players. But where does this end up? Easy. This ends up quite literally easy. The player base is now steamrolling even the hardest content in the game and all challenge has left the chat. This situation is common in looter shooter games and it's a term you've nearly definitely heard before. Power creep. So why is this relevant to the division? Based on the example I gave, you can probably grasp why this is relevant. 
It's quite literally what we've seen since the new dev team took over. I mean, why have 8% damage to armor on gloves for yourself, when you can get 40% for everyone just by hitting a boss with a grenade? Why gain 30% damage at the cost of receiving 60% incoming damage, when you can just run a pistol that gives you 200% damage for switching weapon? Why run anything other than strikers, when you can just run strikers? This is a selection of the easiest questions to answer that anyone's ever seen. With that said, keeping the RPG example we've worked through in mind, it's also one of the saddest. Sure, we all enjoy buffs to the player in the short term. This gives us all a brief hit of dopamine which our monkey brains so crave. We're comparing the new normal to what we're used to. In fact, this is the very reason we all want to use the newest bugged or exploited build to dash through aspirational content in a tenth of the time we could before the glitch was found, or endlessly spam oxidizers at a door to gain immaterial levels, purely for the fact that those levels would otherwise be hard to attain. With that said, in three months, will you feel the same way? When the game offers nothing but one-shots with full auto weapons, instant leveling, or never die survivability, even in the hardest content, will you enjoy it? Or will you just gradually phase over to another game that gives you a personal challenge? Because I sure know which I'd do, and it's not the lesser option. And this is the very point I have in mind when looking at the new PTS. In the TU-19 state of the game, there are already a number of clear outliers which have been power crept. Items which are doing much, much more for the player and the accompanying team than they should be. So what's the Hutchler fix? Easy. Nerf the 5 to 10 problem children back down to the level of the items that existed pre creep This way, the player base retains the difficulty of content which drives replayability in the long run. Sure, it's a big hit in the short term and you likely do lose a number of players for now, but have the faith in the game to know that they will come back later down the line, and they will appreciate this. Have you ever wondered why the same crowd calling for blanket buffs also calls for an additional tier of difficulty in the open world and missions? They want to feel in control, but subconsciously hold the exact same feelings about egregious power creep that I do. But why do the devs do this, Hutchler? Why haven't they realised this? Please sir, link this back to the patch notes now. Fine. Read through the buffs. Even if you're only familiar with one weapon on the list, does that sound like a balanced increase? The average weapon damage increase is 25%. Does it really sound balanced, or does it sound like new player attraction? We now get into heavily opinionated discussion, but drastic times call for drastic measures, and I, for the first time, am going to give my take on why I think the game has been headed in this direction for the last few months. Chapter 2. Catered to the newbie, not the few. Business strategy outlines the steps and approach needed to achieve a desired outcome. In game development, this is viewed on both an organisation-wide basis and a project and franchise basis. Putting on the hat and adopting the perspective of the highest level drivers, investors, what this translates to is how do we exchange content for revenue in both the short and long term? And then putting back on our gamer hat, the RPG example we talked about earlier, suddenly it makes sense. Development studios are driven by the hands that feed them, as we all are. Even short term reflections from an investor could lead to dire long term consequences. So which part do they pick? That of the least resistance, to power creep a game into oblivion for the sake of short-term revenue increase. In material terms, I'm reining this back to the Division franchise, my interpretation of the strategy in play is one of attracting as many new players as possible at the cost of player retention. AKA, make the game incredibly attractive for very casual gamers at the cost of the long-term gamer. An alternative and equally valid take to this would be driving positive content on social media aka sharing success stories from newer but not new players, which serves as an organic marketing effort and once again drives many new individuals to purchase the game. Ultimately this strategy does benefit the diehard player, as the funding trickles down to future projects and content, but in the short term, this hurts, it really sucks. Long term players are given the middle finger because they're not able to offer the same level of funding as players who buy the game on sale, play for 3 hours and never think of it again. I also want to make it very clear, the game should be fun for new players. It should be attractive. From a personal point of view, anyone that can find an escape from the burdens of real life through a single medium of entertainment for as long as I have is incredibly lucky, and I want that for everyone. But that shouldn't be driven artificially without thought for the future and longevity. 
Strategic and ultimately monetary decisions should not so blatantly endeavour to sacrifice one of those sides in favour of the more lucrative one, whichever that is. With all this said, let's also keep in mind that this is absolutely my own interpretation of the strategy in play and it may not be at all correct. What I know for sure is that the community facing team are absolutely doing their best and I do wholeheartedly believe, both from seeing their tweets and chatting to them directly, that they have the best intentions. If I was a gambling man, I'd put my money on the overall direction of the game being completely out of their hands. Chapter 3 It's better 3 hours too soon than a minute too late. We've covered balancing, and I don't want to dwell on that. I've said what I wanted to. Let's now move on to the mechanical changes. In a sea of fixes, including a welcomed fix to the shield peaking exploit which was undeniably fundamentally broken, there were two changes that changed how the game plays on the most basic level for players of all platforms and abilities. These are the health cap in PvE past shade level 2000, and a full block on changing weapons, gear or grenades while in combat. On paper, these changes sound like a big nothing. Why would they change the game as much as I imply they have done? Let's start on the health cap. At face value, this shouldn't affect gameplay, but drill a little bit deeper and you'll reach a mechanic we've all subconsciously been relying on, one-shot protection. This is the invisible barrier that kicks in when you take lethal damage. It's a mechanic we've all relied on for years at this point, and we've got used to tanking enemies that we know have the damage to one-shot us on the basis that protection will kick in and the brief grace period will buy us time to gun them down before they can shoot again. Now, I'm not going to lie and pretend I understand exactly how this prox cools down or anything of the sort, but what I do know is that it somewhat scales on the player's health value. With a cap on health increases past shade level 2000, suddenly you'll get one shot by the same enemy that you would have tanked in the last title update. Moving on to the next, and arguably bigger issue, the block on weapon, gear or grenade switching. This change prohibits any switching of the aforementioned items whilst in combat. Similarly to one-shot protection, we've all just become accustomed to this as one of the game's core mechanics. Run into a room and RNG decides that you should face a bunch of Black Tusk heavies? No problem, just switch to Scorpio and stunlock them. Run out of ammo but you're running two assault rifles? Again, no problem, switch to any other weapon type and keep fighting. Not anymore. Banning hot swapping was clearly a targeted effort at PvP players and or speedrunners. But this has missed the mark and affects the casual player base in a much bigger way. The ability to switch gear on the fly is a skill acquired via playing the game for an extended period of time. Is that a bad thing? Is some skill gap really that terrible? Let's pose an analogy. Imagine planes were re-engineered to be flyable by anyone. How do you think the pilots who had put tens of thousands of hours of training to fly manually would feel? Likewise, do you think the average person would be rushing to get a job as a pilot? What impact would this have more widely on the salary and benefits available to pilots now that they're treated the same? If your answers to the above questions carried mostly negative sentiments, then you understand my point. Games like The Division operate via two psychological retention systems. One is the short-term satisfaction of getting gear, items, or whatever you need, and the other is aspirational content. There's a reason my best performing video is a tutorial on solo legendary strongholds, and that reason is that people want to play better and achieve more. That's where real retention lies. Removing a skill gap removes the second, and arguably more important, of these systems. Having said all that, my issue doesn't fundamentally lie with the changes, but rather the timing. These are core mechanics which affect how the game plays on the most basic of levels, and we've got thousands of hours playing with these mechanics. Changing this stuff is absolutely fine within the first month. Hell, even after a year I'd be happy to adapt. But dropping this almost five years after release? Come on. Chapter 4 If you want a happy ending, it depends on where you end your story. An open letter to Ubisoft. Dear Ubisoft Suit, Do better. Recognise the passion, love and dedication we, the long-term player base, shows for your franchise and do better. If you learned one thing from this video, make it this. The division and gaming more broadly is the escape people reach for when nothing else is going right for them. For many, it's the reason to get out of bed in the morning. 
Developing a committed community who stay with you through thick and thin, even two whole years with no future prospects of content where it was only the diehard players, speedrunners, PvPers, grinding your game. Then turning and stabbing that same community in the back in favour of short-term gains is just poor. But you're not concerned about that, because you have other offerings you can push to those players. So many of my close friends that I've spent thousands of hours with are uninstalling the game, and this is a direct result of the decisions that are being made. In their eyes, the direction of the game as it stands is somehow worse than the period when we were told the game was no longer being supported. I get it, that dedicated player base isn't generating money for you, but what happens when you run out of new players to rope into your power creep dream? What then? And are we not generating money at fault of our own? Or because you have no monetized offerings for players you've, by some miracle, retained? The game has more potential than anything else currently on the market and you know that. But for some reason you push us through the same cycle of bullshit without a single thought in the direction of repercussions for actions. To anyone in a community facing position, this doesn't apply to you. I admire your drive to keep the community informed, engaged and most importantly factually correct. And I genuinely believe that you have the game's best interests at heart. I'm not disillusioned into thinking that the dev team has full creative freedom without at least some level of steer from higher ups. Ubisoft, it's time to face the music and realise you are to blame. I will be a supporter of the franchise for as long as I can motivate myself to do so, but it's time to take a long, hard look in the mirror and do better. Thanks for watching.